Shabbat Shalom. Good morning to you all and welcome to a few quality moments around the Shabbat table with Rabbi Son. It's a blessing to be with you today and I thank you for joining me and letting me be part of your Sabbath journey, this quest we have to get to know the Holy One the way He designed us to get to know Him. To get to, to understand His mission, His calling upon our lives and the mission He has assigned to us in our days upon this earth and understand our relationship to Him, our relationship to one another, our relationship to creation as He designed and intends for it to be. Welcome, 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 and Shabbat Shalom. Good Sabbath to you. Today we get to talk about uh, a single Parsha, Parsha Tazaria, the 27th of the subdivisions of our beautiful Torah uh, lesson plan. The the, the Parsha called Tazria uh, is a take up two chapters of Leviticus, uh, Leviticus chapter 12 and Leviticus chapter 13. And these two Parshas begin to launch us off into what I previously described and will continue for weeks to describe as the Great Kedusha Discourse, the longest free-flowing, uninterrupted uh, episode of Creator Speak in the history of mankind. No other place in any other form, in any other part of scripture, uh, in any, by any religion, is there any more direct speech from the creator of the universe's throne to mankind than in this discourse, which runs from uh, Leviticus chapter uh, 11, chapter 10, virtually starting with uh, middle of chapter 10, all the way through chapter 24. So welcome to this beautiful season. Parsha Tesria is the what I call uh, a parsha or a subdivision or a section of Torah that deals with critical flashpoints of life. This is uh, lessons uh, of importance by the Creator to His creation, to the the prize of His creation, the one who is designed to be uh, like Him, uh, shadowing Him, be an image of Him upon the earth. The, his image bears upon the earth. I'm talking about, of course. Mankind. So the creative universe did not leave us to our own devices down here. He gave us this precious gift of his words, his creator speak, his creator script, all the things he's given to us that tell, teach us uh, like an instruction manual how to operate at these high levels of, uh, of, of activity, high levels of impact upon the world. But there uh, are warnings that are contained within his words. He wouldn't be a good father. He wouldn't be a good creator. He wouldn't be a good mentor. He wouldn't be a good, a good God if he did not give us the warnings of what to watch out for, to the danger zones. We don't have to understand all the aspects of the dangers, all the aspects of the flashpoints. We need to just know that where they are and know that he has a protocol, he has a discipline, he has a way to get through them and go to the other side. Uh, that's what will make, mark us as being different from the rest of the world. We have confidence that he has a way through every flashpoint of life, every critical danger zone of life. So I call this the Parsha of critical flesh and spirit flashpoints, the Holy One's warnings to us, uh, his, his comments and his instructions as to how to navigate through those flashpoints. What do I mean by flashpoints? There are certain uh, things, parts of life, parts of living, uh, aspects of life, danger zones of life, where the holy things of God intersect with and are offset with the profane things of this world and of our, our flesh, uh, our emotions, our hormones, our instincts, our wants and, di and dis not wants and we don't want, we do want our likes and dislikes, our, all those things that go, our cultural differences, all the things that uh, where the holy things of God intersect and sometimes are, are just completely opposite of, opposite to the things that are profane, the things of this world. And uh, similarly, uh, there's a, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, exacerbated, it's made worse or made more intense, at least, by the fact that there's also these intersections between that which is what the new, uh, what the English Bibles call clean, uh, tahor. Uh, the realm of the tahor also intersects with and is offset by and is opposite to that which is tamay, or uh, English King James Bible called it unclean. 
So these danger zones are at the points of intersection where holy intersects with profane, clean or tahor intersects with unclean or tamay. And what happens in the fallout of these crashes? It's like a line of scrimmage between these two. There's On the one side is the holy and the other side is the profane. On the one side is the clean and the other side is the unclean. What happens when these uh, clashes hit? The clash of the titans happens. Will the fallout from these clashes be tov? Will it be a fountain of good, a fountain of, of restoration for creation and, and life-giving things? Or will it be ra? Will it be uh, destructive, uh, um, sabotaging the, the whole plan? Those are the questions we ask. Well, uh, this is that part of the, of the Torah in which the Holy One's going to shine his light beautifully upon the biggest problems, the most dangerous spiritual problems, particularly, of life. <clears throat> I call this the tent maker's dream continued in his light, in the creator's light, in the light of his countenance, in the light that emanates from his presence, in the Kedusha energy that flows from his being into our us, in his light we can see. We can see things that no normal human beings cannot see. We can see things we couldn't see before we interacted with his divinity, his holiness, before we got to know him and he began to reveal himself to us and manifest it into our lives. So we're in the ear of the tabernacle, and he is tabernacling among us. His presence among us changes the way everything happens. It even changes the way we look at life, the way we experience life, the way we approach life, and the way we handle the traumas, the dramas, the issues of life. In his light, we see things that the rest of the world does not see. How do I mean by that? How can I turn that into scripture? Well, let's talk about Psalm 119, 105. Uh, your word, the, the psalmist said, is a lamp unto my feet. Oh, it's like the light, the path being spread out before, shown before me, like a flashlight or a, 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 a candle burning to show me the way. Your light, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what happens when we get to, close to him. His word begins to operate like a flashlight or a spotlight going in front of us, showing the path we're to follow. Torah then becomes, his word, uh, spoken in creator's feet, becomes a navigational app for us, an app for us, an uh, uh, application for us. And Torah as a navigational app. Like some in the world we have GPS, uh, but in the spiritual world, in the, in the world of the kingdom, we have Torah as our navigational app. It is our guidebook, you see, for navigating the flashpoints at which the holy intersects with the profane and the clean intersects with the unclean and gives us a pathway through to covenant life. What are the sources of this light? Well, his eternal words, his devarim, his Torah, his mitzvot, his commandments as they're written in English, all the things, his ordinances and his stories, his testimonies, uh, all the aspects of what he, how he speaks to us in the various different ways, these are all, these are all sources of light for us. Uh, then also, what really turns it into bright light and intensifies the beam of those things is his abiding presence. Light shedding from his very essence of being. If we try to get his words, we, we sometimes have to look through a glass darkly. But when he's with us, when he's there, he's, he, he's uh, resting upon us, he's abiding with us, he's shakaning as, the, as he said he would. And when he's doing that, oh, that's when the intense light shines. And we have then the, the, his presence in the, in the Mishkan or the tabernacle, his presence in the Mikdash, the temple, his presence in the life teaching of Yeshua and the pattern, the examples that he set for us. His pattern, his, his presence also in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So uh, with uh, Isaiah, with Yeshayahu, the prophet, I would say to you, Bid Yaakov Lecha, come, O household of Yaakov. And let us walk in the light of the Holy One. And God is light. First John 1, 7. God is light. Take it in. And in Him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we're lying. And we are not practicing. We're not disciplining ourselves in the truth. Uh, but if, if, if as and when and to the extent we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, his son, 
cleanses us, he tahars us, it brings us to the clean, the tahor realm, away from all hatta, away from all diversions, away from all distractions, away from all detours from his will and his ways. In his light we see things. Let his light shine. Without his light, we really cannot see things the way they really are. We only can see things the way our natural eyes reveal them. In his light, we see things. We see people differently. We see things and the world and the times and our lives and our purpose differently than they do because they don't see in the light. Oh, but the way have the light is such a precious gift, navigational tool. By the light of the Holy One, we are empowered. Indeed, we are impelled to visualize and interact with the people and with the things and with the places and with the situations that we encounter everywhere we are, the sole of our foot treads, every person we meet, everything we look at, everything we encounter in life. We look at those things in His light. We're impelled to as wise and disciplined ambassadors of kingdom of the kingdom of heaven not as out for ourselves trying to protect ourselves, not as out for ourselves trying to get what we want out of this world, not as slaves. We interact with them as ambassadors of the great king of heaven. We are not slaves to appetite. We're not slaves to instinct. We're not slaves to hormone flows. We're not slaves to emotions and triggers. We're not slaves to cultural predispositions and ethnic pushing and forcing and manipulations by what we think the ethnicity that we're of wants us to do or thinks we should do. We're not bound by those things if, as, when, and to the extent we allow his light to shine upon our lives. There is no ethnicity in Torah. Welcome to the Kedusha Discourse of Torah. The Holiness Code, as it's called, or the, 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 era, the era where the Holy One is giving his operations manual on how to live life on earth and interact with, intersect with, and yet not be distracted or dis, uh, detoured by the flesh and its demands and its, and its cruelty and its oppression. Not by Ra, the, the negative force of the energy that happened, started in the garden. Not by the seduction of the darkness. No, but instead, well, we can walk in the breath, the empowerment, the tov, and the light of the countenance of God. Well, the summary that I would give you of the discourse we're in, before we get to the details of it, are if, if we're going to be part of the great nation that he called us to be, he promised Abraham he would raise the, uh, up his seed to be a great nation. He would make of him a great nation. If we're going to be a part of that great nation, and that great nation was to bless every family on the face of the earth, to be a blessing. That's what we're called, to bless, to be a blessing. To be a great nation that is a blessing to every family upon the face of the earth. If we're to do that... And if we're going to approach and commune with the Holy One and know Him and interact with Him and, and draw our inspiration and strength from Him and get our instructions and, and directions from Him, ah, and if we're going to touch holy things as well as profane and clean things as well as unclean, we need to know what side we're on. We need to know why we're here. We need to know what it is that we're called to be doing and what we're called to be not doing, to be offsetting and counterbalancing. So, <laughs> we have learned that there are unclean things in the world. There, there is what's called tuma. Tuma is this uh, fragmenting force or pull or impulsion. Uh, we think of in, in uh, I think in the King James versions of the, of the New Testament, it's called we, and especially in the Mark, they refer to unclean spirits. And we don't really know how to make that. Of course, the Western world, the Greek mindset, uh, and now the Roman and then the um, ultimate Western mindset is always that we think in terms of nouns and objects. And, and Hebrew always thinks opposite. It thinks in terms of action. So when we say an unclean spirit, it's, it's not a noun we're talking about. It's what it's doing. It's the doing part. It's, un pre it's spreading Tuma, spreading uncleanness, spreading that which is tame in the world, fragmenting things, causing them to be conflicted in loyalties, causing them to have emotional upset and disturbance that don't allow them to continue mission. So what have we learned about Tuma so far? We found that he found it in foreign fire, Zaish Zerah, what, what Nadav and Abihu 
I experience that. The, the ways of other cultures, of worshiping their gods, that's Tuma. We learned that in chapter 10, at the very beginning, uh, the introduction basically to the uh, Kedusha Discourse. We learn that there are animals that have been affected by uh, the fall, and pre-flood they became something different than they were created to be. They are maybe born into a certain state, but they were not created for that state, and that is not their ultimate state. So we have predators. We have uh, what's called unclean animals, or in the uh, in the uh, low tahor animals, it's called in the story of Noah. And there were these animals. Where did they come from? And why were they uh, different than the animals that were called clean animals? We learn there's something about the animal kingdom, the the created beings that have been corrupted in some regards. Some of the species have been corrupted, and so we see predators, and we see carrion eaters, and we see uh, trash. Can uh, walking trash cans and crawling trash cans and swimming trash cans uh, out there in the world that are doing things that shouldn't have to be done. If man was doing what he is supposed to do and make the world fruitful and beautiful and productive for all of its creations, all of its species, they wouldn't be eating what they're eating and doing what they're doing and destroying what they're destroying and, and uh, stalking what they're stalking. But we have these. There's, there's this uncleanness that's come into animal kingdom. And we have to know where it is and what's the worst parts of it and how to not uh, engage with it too closely. This week we're going to learn that there is tuma, there is uncleanness, there is this force that dissolve, divides and, and, and breaks up and causes conflict and loyalty in hormones, in, in the seasons of great hormonal uh, flow, uh, conception, pregnancy, especially uh, sickness, illness, um, skin breakouts. There are different things that happen that cause human beings to have uh, hormone releases that are, they have an uncleanness to them that cause us to be selfish, cause us to be caught up in actions that are not the Holy One's plan for us, uh, and, and get so excited about them that we forget who we are and what we're here to do. And to forget the divisions, forget the separations the, between the holy and the profane and the clean and the unclean. All right, so we're going to talk about some of those things. There's so much more to talk about in this, this, this Parsha. But I want to remind you as we go into this, lest you think this is just all nonsense. What do I need to know this for? What, would, what does the Holy One care what I touch? What does the Holy One care what I'm cl close to? What does the Holy One care how much I give in to my emotions, my, my appetites, my urges? My, how much, how, how does He care, what does He care how I handle a pregnancy or, a cons or a, what leads to a pregnancy, the getting pregnant part? How do I, how does He care about my sexuality? Why does He care about all that stuff? Why doesn't He just want me in some meeting somewhere to do holy things? Why, why does He care about these intimate details of my life? Why is that the focus of his greatest speech upon earth and ever were given to, why is the Kedusha discourse containing all these intimate private details about our personal lives and the things that we do that we don't like to talk about in public why is he getting very up close and personal with us because he said the theme of this book repeated over and over again is to his people be holy actually be holy ones be Kedushim be emitters uh, and transmitters of Kedusha energy, the energy of heaven. Be that because as to the extent I, he said, the Holy One himself, I am that. I am a Kedusha emitter, a Kedusha transmitter, a Kedusha revealer, releaser. I am Kedosh. Be holy one for I am holy. Be Kedoshim for I am Kedosh. Well, sometimes <laughs> that gets extremely difficult being holy as he is holy especially when we reach the great flashpoints, the flesh traps of life. Now, the thing is, the Holy One wants us to learn that we're like a wild horse. We have a wild horse nature since the fall. But that wild horse can be gentled and trained and become responsive to the, the writing, the, the, the leadership, the guiding of the one who we serve, the Holy One. We can be learn to be gentled. We can learn to be trained. We can learn not to harness the strongest hormones that life in the flesh engenders. We can learn to redirect their energy to the advancement of the kingdom rather than the advancement of what we want or feel like we want in a given moment. 
be holy as he is holy. That's our thing. What is it? Why does he keep saying that? How is it even possible? We are many things, of course, beloved. We are, we are loved. We know that we're loved by the creator of the universe. If we think about it, we realize he's let, just letting us breathe, letting our hearts beat again, letting us have relationships, interactions with people, letting us see his creation and his beauty, the sun rises, the sun sets, the waterfalls, the mountain ranges, the, the seas, the waves that roll upon the sea. Why, we see, get to see so much and do so much and know so much. Hear the sound of children crying and, and laughing and, and, and our, our loved ones speaking to us. We get so many gifts. He loves us. And now that we are forgiven, we know we have not walked the way he designed us to walk. We have not lived the way he called us. We are not all we could be. But we know we are forgiven for those things. We are know we have been redeemed from bondage. He's given us a, a, a pathway to walk that does not require us to fail, does not require us to, to fume and, and fuss and, and be angry and excited. He gives us a pathway forward in life. He know, we know we're that. We're redeemed. We're called. But are we holy? Oh, can we possibly be holy? Can we become free, flowing, wellsprings of an energy, of Kedusha energy, of light and love and hope and peace? Can we offer hope and redemption to fallen humanity? Can we do that? Can we be that? Can we offer a, a better way, a more excellent way? Can we offer uh, a guiding hand and a, a green thumb uh, to the polluted creation and all of its species? Can, can, we, can we learn to cull the lies? Can we learn to navigate the minefields of the flesh and the pseudo-intellect and all ethnicity and culture and governmental theories, political theories and science? And can we learn to navigate these minefields of Tuma? And begin to walk in those that holiness he's called us to. Well, we are realm travelers, and we are to be realm rangers. We are to learn not only to travel between realms of holy and profane, and pure and unpure, and clean and unclean. We're also to learn to be the masters, to learn to be the the shepherds, the 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 ones who guide and form the boundaries. And, respect and honor and then to the, some level degree we manage the boundary between the, these realms and he said it this way last week he, we learned he said you are to badal you are to make a distinction and be a distinction between that which is holy and that which is unholy and then between that which is clean and that which is unclean you are to make this the badal we are the ones who are to set the boundaries and respect and honor the boundaries and keep that which belongs in the Tahor realm, Tahor. And keep that which belongs in the Tamei realm, Tamei. And the things that are in the balance, weighing in the balance, to cause them to drift toward the, the, the clean, the Tahor, the heel, whole, and also to the Kadosh, the holy, and away from the unclean, the profane, the common. We are to do these things. We are to distinguish between the holy and the profane, and between the clean and the unclean, in order that we may Yara, be a guide, be an a, a arrow, be an example, and a model and a teacher to B'nai Israel of all the things the Holy One has spoken by the hand of Moshe. That was Leviticus 11, 10. Or 10, 10, excuse me. So what is Tuma? This uncleanness thing, this thing where, this force that, that dissolves, that causes disintegrates, causes conflicting loyalties, causes uh, us to wander away from the path. It's not sin, it's not hacha. This is just the idea of what that force, that impelling force is pulling us toward the, that direction of darkness. I call it kryptonite for Kedoshim. Tuma is kryptonite. For Kedoshim. If you know the Superman story, supposedly in the in the in the drama, he came from a planet called Krypton, and uh, there was this one substance from his home planet that came to Earth whenever he came to Earth, and if he can, it was exposed to kryptonite, he began to. Uh, destruct his powers begin to be diminished he began to have less impact he became in danger physically of his life and that's what Tuma is for us it is kryptonite for us when, as we act against Kedoshim as holy ones as the holy ones ones who are called to be holy as he is holy oh there is Tuma in uh, Esh Zerah, a foreign fire. There are Tuma in the fallen species that have become predators 
and have become uh, carrion eaters and become garbage collectors and are not following in wholeness and fullness the way they were initially designed for creation and particularly in Eden. Ah, we have these, but we also were going to find out we have Tuma in ordinary human activities, essential human activities, even human uh, being fruitful and multiplying. Even in taking dominion over the earth, we're going to find that we're going to be exposed to kryptonite. <laughs> we are kid our Kedoshim uh, personas are going to have to deal with kryptonite and have to learn how to how to put a lead shield over the kryptonite, which is Superman's way. I'm using that as an example, just a metaphor. Uh, so what is Kutuma? What is this uncleanness, this kryptonite? It's that which tears open an old hole in our soul. We have these holes in our soul from the fall. Uh, and from the time before the, the flood, we heard that the world was filled with raw, with evil, with shakat, with corruption, with hamas, which was violence and cruelty. We learned that the world became filled, and the humankind was continually drawn into it. And every thought and inclination of the heart of man was raw, shakat, and hamas. And we had the flood, but we decided that after the flood, even yet, Rashikat and Hamas holes are still in our souls. We just have now a new chance, a new opportunity to overcome them and heal them. But what is Tuma? Tuma is something that tears open that old, old hole in the soul, that old wound. It begins to stir it and cause it to be inflamed again and act up again and ooze uh, filth again and destroy our lives around us again, destroy species around us, and destroy environments around us, spheres of influence that we might have, homes, families, workplaces, households, uh, governments, uh, community life. All these things become endangered by the oozing of this open wounds of Rosh Hashanah and Hamas, and all that is opened up again through Tuma. The first instance of this that we refer to in, in scripture, the first instance was something, uh, some tumor was introduced to, to a human being in this way, it was when Shechem, uh, this prince of, of the city called Shechem, uh, raped Dina. He took his pleasure, his emotions, he took his hormone flows, he took his appetite, he took his cruelty, his Rashikat and Hamas, he took it out on this poor little defenseless girl and he did the things to her that were unspeakable. He used her and manipulated her in ways and, and defiled her in ways in her mind, her soul, her spirit as well as her body. The body part was the minor part, believe it or not. It was what she did to her soul. He fragmented her. He tumud her. He gave her complete connection to immersion in tumud. And she, the Torah told us that she became Tume. She became defiled, I think our English Bibles call it. But the word is just a word that the English Bibles threw in there. The idea is the old wounds of Rosh Hashanah and Hamas that were in this poor, innocent child's soul, but not active, became active because of what Shechem did to her. And it worked all the way through her body, to her soul, to her emotional state, to her mind to her psyche, into who she was, and it was traumatic, it was psychological, it was uh, so spiritual, it was physical, all kinds of trauma. Now you understand what Tuma is, and why it's a bigger deal. Uncleanness is a bigger deal than most modern theologians want to admit, because this is the real thing about what our problem in humanity is. We are not even aware of what is uncleanness. And what it's doing to us, what it's doing to our children whenever we're exposing them to it, or to us when we're exposing ourselves to it, Tuma, is a critically dangerous thing. It's our kryptonite, kryptonite for Kedoshim. Well, we're going to learn that in the process of human reproduction, in the process of carrying forth the seed of the Holy One, or the seed of whatever force we're living is, there are basically two kinds of of, uh, of, of, of seed. There is life-giving seed and there is stench of rotting flesh seed. The Master taught it like this, the Master Yeshua of Nazareth, the Rabbi, our beloved Rabbi. He said, you know, that there, the man went forth and he sowed his field with, with wheat and it rose up and then an enemy came along and he sowed a different kind of seed, the seed of tares. And so now we have this two, this is, is metaphor being given by the Holy One to describe 
we can carry life-giving seed in us, we can carry the holy, the tahor, or we can carry the stench of rotting flesh. We can carry that which activates and stirs other people's and our own holes in our soul and causes this reactivation, this exacerbation of the old scarred wounds of Rosh, Shakat, and Hamas. Which are we carrying? Are you carrying life-giving seed? Are you carrying wheat? Or are you carrying tears? Oh, you know by the way you talk. The way people will know if they have eyes to see and ears to hear. And they're in the light of the countenance of the Holy One. They'll see, or you will see, was that life that I just spoke or that I, my facial expressions just revealed? Was that life that my bearing, my demeanor gave in the, into this atmosphere that I just walked into? Was that life in the way I, I acted or reacted to the situation or was that tears? Was that the, the tuma? Feel rotting flesh ways of destruction. Are we zera l'chaim, seed of life? Are we zera lemut, the seed of death? And Torah this week in Parsha Tazri is going to give us the two extreme examples. Zera l'chaim, a woman who conceives and gives birth. This is such the, a beautiful part of life. And then he's going to give us the other. In chapter 12, it's going to be about zera l'chaim. And the other extreme is going to be put forth in chapter 13. Zera Lamut, the seed of death, the death stench of rotting flesh, the Ra, the issue of Tumah. So, and that's going to be the, the Zera Lahaim is all about giving life, a woman bearing a child and bringing forth a new generation of life and a new hope for the world. But Zera Lamut is about the uh, King James Version calls him the leper, the Metzora. The one who is oozing negativity and lashan hara, uh, speech, negative speech, and, and depression, and, and causing his spheres of influence to be polluted by that, and causing him to be toxic to the rest of the world. Which one are you carrying? The seed of life, Zera Lahain, or are you carrying Zera Lamut? You get to choose. And if we have seen yourself carrying Zera Lamut too many times, you still have an opportunity to bring forth. Zera Lahaim, follow the protocols of God. Carriers of life giving seed can become carriers of stench of rotting flesh. But the good news is, carriers of the stench of rotting flesh can also become carriers of life giving seed. See, there's a delicate balance that must be maintained at all times as we intersect with all these interactions, all these intersection points. As we go through and navigate, try to navigate through the emotional charge, the emotionally charged things, through the hormonally re, hormonal release uh, episodes like pregnancy or or uh, conflict or uh, marriage or, or sexuality or opinions, uh, ideology and opinions giving, all these things that cause emotions and hormones and 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 pseudo intellectual pride to arise. These are where the tumor of trouble exists. And all it takes for us to become carriers of the stench of rotting flesh is to, to not know how to handle and to mishandle the too much trouble experiences we have. So, these extremes that are given in Parsha Tansriya that we'll discuss, I hope you will discuss in your own times of study, but we'll discuss a little bit. These extremes, one of giving life and the one of bringing forth death with everything you say, everything you speak, bringing forth hardship, bringing forth conflict, bringing forth controversy. Which one are you? Which one do you want to bring forth? You see, I call these things high tide exposures, the hard lessons that come with high tide exposures. It's like you can imagine uh, you're, you're by the ocean and all of a sudden a rogue wave comes up and wherever you're sitting or if you're wading in the water, suddenly you're over your head in this crazy powerful rogue wave you weren't expecting it you didn't think it was going to happen but then you're in it and how do you survive how do you overcome this rogue wave well that's what these emotionally charged debates and discussions and interactions these hormonally activating encounters with the opposite gender or with somebody else these things that cause flight fight and flight or or intense lust or uh, urge and appetite to arise. These are high tide. These are rogue waves, and we were not ready for them. We had not prepared ourselves to deal with this rush, this flood, this high tide exposure to 
Tuma and what it's trying to do, the Tuma, I don't know, it's kind of like personalizing it, but it's just a force that is drawing out the, the Ra Shakat and Hamas wounds, the five holes in our soul that we've been discussing in the Corbinot discourse before we got to this. So what do you do when you encounter one of life's rogue waves? And what do you do when you enter into what I call the mind harbors of the fallen flesh and the pseudo-intellect? What do you do when you have to deal with political disagreements and scientific disputes and debates? What do you deal with religious uh, theory and theorem and, and all up in the intellectual mindset of theology and people disagree with it and they get all upset about it? What do you do when you get into these mind harbors of life? How do you handle you? Do you walk through unscathed? Do you walk through according to the plans and the instructions of the Holy One? Or do you cave in and become distracted? Are you a good surf walker? <laughs> Life is an ocean, you see. It's a metaphor I'll use. Life is an ocean with waves. All men are sailors on that ocean. The tides of life will ebb and they will flow. Winter will turn to spring. Whispers of discontent will turn to artillery shells of revolution. And with all the changes that we encounter as we surf and walk through the surf of life, the ocean of life as we walk along it, with all the changes will come joy, but also pain. Hope, but also despair. A sense of gain and moving forward and acquiring things and a sense of loss, bereavement to failure, a sense of ecstasy, and, and also a sense of agony at times, health, and then disease, and sickness, and wasting away, in, in capacities, uh, disabilities. Well, all these things happen. These are all part of the waves of life, building life and stalking death. These two will pass, so sail on. But the surf's up. There is a rising of the tide, and we have to learn how we're going to handle it. These examples the Holy One's given us of the most emotional times uh, of the world, one on the positive side where a woman is giving birth to a child, the other on the uh, negative side where someone's so angry that all they can talk about is negative things, and it begins to infect everything they touch, including their own skin and their own house and their own garments and their own uh their own uh pots and 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 uh, and bowls of their of their of their existence yes we see things in the spirit when we're with in the presence of the holy one the world may not be able to see it the scientists may not be able to see it the educators may not be able to see it the theologians definitely will not be able to see it but when we're with the holy one walking the light of his countenance we begin to see the effect that caving into hormones or caving into emotions and moods, caving into the energy uh, of the society or the inertia of society, caving into the uh, cultural or the ethnic uh, biases, prejudices and prides, caving into the attraction revulsion matrix, uh, the health and sickness seasons, the inspiration disaffection seasons, caving in and getting distracted by these things and as they rise and they fall within us, these are the tides of life, and how we handle them depends. We'll see inside whether we truly are becoming holy, as the Holy One is holy, and whether we are truly becoming a blessing to every family on the face of the earth, whether we truly are becoming a pattern, a model of the more excellent way, or whether we're struggling mightily and maybe causing more damage and sabotage than we're causing good. Ah, things that rise and fall within include hormones and emotions and moods energy levels and inertia levels and attraction revulsion health and sickness and inspiration those things arise from within and they cause all this too much to to be uh, in our in our face we have to decide how to deal with it all things come from without out with outside of ourselves things like the seasons with every season every uh, eclipse we just had an eclipse in our world uh with every every moon phase with every weather pattern of high and low pressure all these things cloud cover versus sunshine change they, these rising and falling the tides and causing a stirring within us of some negative or some positive emotion level of hormones or inertia health feeling of health and wellness oh these inspiration versus disaffection or, or writer's block all these things 
affect us. And also that's a, then we get to the social part, the political, the social movements, you know, the social justice movements, the government policies, the politics, the ideology, the philosophy, the ethnocentricity, and the religious arguments, all these external things of human beings, of human culture, these things cause the tumma to rise and the fall and the waves of the surf to come up. And we have to learn how to navigate those things. Huh. Well, it helps us to have a call to worship. Let us sing our call to worship, and then we'll talk just a moment about dealing with Tuma, the Holy One's way. Barukta. Barukta Adonai Hamvorak Barukta Adonai Hamvorak Leolam Ba'ed Barukta Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher bakarbanu miko ha'amin Vinatalanu et toratu Baruch ata Adonai Noten Yes, Amen, Ken. And now may you open our eyes, O Holy One, that we may see wondrous things in your Torah. For we are just strangers in this earth. So please do not hide your instructions, your commandments from us. Parsha Shemini ended with the Holy One telling us, as part of his creator speak, download, that you are not to corrupt yourself, to shakats yourself, not become corrupted by any creeping thing that creeps, <laughs> ah, that you encounter in the world. Nor are you to make yourself to may with them. Nor are you to take on their tumma, their uncleanness. Lest you take on their tumma. For I, he said, am the Holy One, your God. And you are therefore to holify yourself. You are to kadash yourself. You are to bathe yourself in kadusha, energy and purity yourselves. And you are to become kedoshim because I am kedosh. Here was the theme of the Parsha, just in the last verse. A partial meaning we just finished. Neither are you to make yourselves to may with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Never are you to do that, for I am the Holy One who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You are therefore to be Kedoshim, for I am Kedosh. Once again, this theme is pounded into us. We are to be Kedoshim, for He is Kedosh. And that opens the lines of Parsha Tazaria, chapter 12, verse 1. And the Holy One spoke to Moshe, and he said, Daber el Israel Speak to Bnei Israel and say, Isha ki tazria zakar, a woman who germinates seed and then gives birth to a zakar, a boy. The Tamea Shivat Yamin, she will be Tame for seven days. Something in this process of, of, of conceiving first, the process of the conceiving, and then the process of carrying the child, and the process of germinating. All something in this long process, beginning with, with germination or conceiving, ending with birth, during this process, something about this contains Tuma. It introduces, it, it pretend, threatens to reopen the old wounds of the soul of Ra, Shakat, Namas. The Tamea Shivat Yamin, she will be Tamei for seven days. Look at her in a danger zone, in a place of, of extreme vulnerability where certain focuses need to happen. So the, the, the Tamea Shivat Yamin, she will be Tamei for seven days. Ki me nidat devota tima. And she, as, the same way she is Tamei during the time she's isolated for her flow, her menstrual flow, the infirmity of the uterine lining, shedding, and resetting process. So we learn that there's something about this conception to carrying the child over the nine month period gestation to the giving birth that is uh, connected to the intersection of the holy and the profane and the clean and the unclean. This is a flashpoint. This whole idea of re, uh, reproduction. Well, maybe we should say, where have we heard these terms for? The yalad is the Hebrew word, or give birth. Uh, where have we, where does that come, where, where have, do, have we been introduced to that before? Oh, do you remember Genesis chapter 3? In Genesis chapter 3, if you recall, the first thing the Holy One said to Hava after the fall and after her being exposed of what had happened and she had done, 
Okay, he said, I will cause you to have sorrow, to have displeasure, discomfort in your conception mm. and in pain in your labor of birth. Oh, so the whole process from, from the conception, we see this introduced back in Genesis 3. He warned us that he's going to and have it. And he says, and your desire will be for your husband. You All you want to do is have a life with your husband. But you can't do that once you have entered into You can't just be, see, before you marry, before you mate with another person, it's all about you and what you want, what you like, what you want, what you want to have happen. And then when you marry or you mate, it becomes all about you and your, your spouse, you and your loved one. And about us, our time of us, just us. Oh, but then when you can see, <laughs> when you can see when you're carrying a child and giving ready to give birth to a child, it's not going to be about you. It's no more about you. It's no more about you and you, uh, you, just you and your husband or your boy, your girlfriend or your boy. Not just you. It's about now the process of birth. This changes everything about your, your approach to life. So, <laughs> he goes on. He says, yemol basar alato. And On the eighth day of the child's life, the excess flesh of, is to be circumcised. A remembrance of the Abrahamic covenant sign. Remember what he told Abraham now. On the eighth day of the child's life, born in your household or adopted comes into a born, you, you take this flesh of the foreskin. And you, you cut that ring around that and you cause that to be a, a, a sign, a covenant sign. You are going to walk with me. And so you see this restoration process is beginning. It's how we're going to enter into and commit to the res restoration process away from the pain to my uh, situation that we've been dealing with. He says, "V'shloshim yom um shloshet yamim teshev," and then thirty days and three days she is to be restfully abiding, bidme tahora bekol kodesh, and in the blood of her restored restored wholeness, which uh, is going to be restored. The woman is going to be restored. She's going to overcome and be restored to her state of tahor, out of her danger zone, over a period of thirty-three days. After well, eight, eight days then. Seven days, the eighth day, 33 days, basically 40 days. She's going to have this period to recuperate. And you're going to find out later, and I'm going to need to leave you in a moment, so I'll leave you to think about the rest of the things in this Parsha. And the contrast between the uh, the woman who's given birth to a child and the one who has an eruption of tumay, tum tuma on his skin, his face, his hair, his clothes, his house his his garments well see once you see there may be a connection but i won't have time to talk to you about that i do want to talk to you about one factor about the issue of the difference between if it's a male child if it's a zakar versus if the child the woman gives birth to is a female child a nekaba and well the hebrew words mean everything to you the english words don't mean much the hebrew word zakar which we translate as boy or a male child is a word that means remembrance, uh, memory, uh, commemoration. Uh, and you know that the, the male, the father of the household becomes the memory carrier. Uh, the idea of a ch boy child is as a memory maker. And you have this memories, this, the carrier of the memories, the carrier of the pro cross generational things of, of who you are and your, uh, your bloodlines and all these things are carried through this male. The female is the Nekaba, is the excavator, is the one who, who, uh, it, it, she becomes the, well, I've got to go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Holy One was the first excavator. He f took dirt, he took the dirt of the earth and he formed man. Now, he could have made all ch people that way. But he chose another process. He chose to make the female the dirt, as it were. Not to say she's dirty. To make her the source, the, the source of life. It's a precious gift to the female. But it's also a precious responsibility, a serious responsibility. And so the word nekaba means to be the, the one who's excavated, who does the excavation. So the woman becomes the source of excavation for generations. One is memory. One is commemoration and carrying forth uh, the, the stories from generation to generation and the, the, the plan from generation to generation. The other is to make sure there is a, a, a fertile field 
and a good nurturing area to take care of the memory maker as it goes on. Each one has its purpose. Each one has its, has its place. Now, when we lose our focus on that, and we begin to focus only on ourselves or what we want, or what the world's saying, or what our ethnicity thinks is appropriate, or what our culture thinks is appropriate, or what science tells us to do, or what medicine tells us to do. We focus on those things exclusively, and they begin to stir up these old Rosh Hashanah and Hamas wounds of our soul. Uh, that's when we have Tuma active in us. We need to learn to be able to, to navigate, to, to, to surf the tides of life. How do we do it? Follow the instructions of the Torah. Stay close to the Holy One. He will guide us through. Well, it's time for me to leave you, beloved. I hope you enjoyed our time together. I did. Our little time around the Shabbat table with the Rabbi's son. Let me know where you are, what's going on in your life, if I can pray for you, or if you just want to share something or a question with me. Blessed are you. Is the Holy One, our God. Amen. See you next week.